So, um, as, as Diane mentioned, um, we're going to go over uh, where we're headed with networking in OpenShift 3, talk a little bit about where we've been and some of the design constraints we've been working with and what we see uh, coming in the future. Uh, I'm going to try and cover a lot of topics in the first 20 minutes, so uh, we have a lot of time to show the demo and to show some of the stuff actually working and give people an idea of what, um, what some of the lower level technical details are. So with OpenShift uh, 2, and the existing OpenShift system that's out there today. Uh, we, had a, we had a fairly straightforward system for networking in that the original goal of OpenShift was to allow administrators to run um, multiple applications on the same machine uh, to make better use of the hardware resources that they already had, as well as to offer um, you know, additional capabilities like being able to run lots and lots and lots of development applications that take traffic very frequently. And one of the key constraints there was networking. So a server that needs to connect or to host, a, uh, whether it's a web server or a message bus or a database, needs to be able to listen on a network address and have people be able to reach it. So in OpenShift 2, this system was fairly simple in that each of the, um, each of the gears, um, what OpenShift calls a container, uh, each of those little subcomponents of an application uh, were able to get their own private internal IP address, which was not reachable from outside the host. And for each of the services that would be running inside of that uh, container, we would map in a port. And part of the reason for this is that you know, long before network namespaces uh, were really usable within the kernel, this was one of the few ways that you could achieve this kind of hosting without a lot of um, complicated network and complicated network crossover stuff. Uh, this, this idea of mapping an external port uh, to a high external port to a low uh, internal port or address uh, is a pretty common pattern. And so OpenShift had started down this path you know, quite a few years ago. And as the networking and container space evolved, um, we both learned a lot of lessons about building applications that can talk to each other as well as uh, learning the things that we knew we wanted to carry forward uh, into our new system. So in the diagram here, I'm just giving a simple example of what in OpenShift 2 um, the world might have looked like. So you've got four hosts, and each of those hosts is running multiple components uh, on it. Each of those is uh, what we call a gear, um, or today we're calling containers. And each of those containers has its own internal address, where Apache, for instance, would listen on um, that 127 address on port 8080. And OpenShift would set up a mapping between the host's address and a high port to the inside. Uh, and then applications, uh, other components of the application elsewhere on the cluster would be able to talk to it over, um, over that high port. So both an external load balancer or the component of application one that's on host number four we talked to 1053.34.1, which is the host's IP address at um, port 34985, which is just an example. And there's a lot of things that we took from this as we've, um, as we've worked and helped people build applications with OpenShift over the years. Uh, I think the hardest one that straight up front is that most network software in the world is designed to automatically listen on all addresses. It tries to, to bind to 000. zero, zero and in the OpenShift uh, 2 model that actually wasn't possible because without some way of isolating each of the containers from each other at the kernel level, um, 000 would be the host address and it would be all the other different um, interfaces that were set up on the system. And while there are some benefits to making sure that software can work, um, can parameter parameterize which address it wants to listen to, in terms of practical effort, this was a cost that was pushed onto users, right? Users had to know that they couldn't bind to 000. They had to use an environment variable or a config file or some other mechanism. And so as we go forward, that was something that right off the bat was a barrier to entry as people brought their existing um, legacy applications or even existing frameworks and tried to run them on top of OpenShift. Secondly, port mapping adds an extra layer of indirection. So not only do you have to know what host um, 
your service is running on, but you also need to encode what port they're running on. That means that the internal and external port was different. So a lot of um, software that we want to run on OpenShift, things like MongoDB or Zookeeper, um, scalable databases and um, other things like Cassandra, as well as um, some of the scalability solutions that are built around MySQL, all of those, almost all of those at least, have as one of their underlying assumptions that the address that they listen on is the same address that other people reach them on. And so that the port mapping, and they also in some cases assumed that the port that they listened on was the port that others could reach them on. So uh, going into OpenShift 3, a key consideration in our mind was trying to reduce the complexity there so that we can run more of these kinds of software. And in general, in OpenShift, uh, depending on how you configure your system, you can set up global blacklists or global whitelists of things of how these each individual application uh, components can talk to each other. But there really are, there's no one solution that fits every deployment's use cases. In some cases, uh, allowing um, one application to talk to a component on a in a completely different uh, context within the OpenShift deployment was actually a very valuable feature. People building microservices or who had uh, well thought out integration and authentication solutions um, benefited from being able to reach out and directly connect to other components. And on the, other, on the flip side of that, in some environments, the individual applications needed to be tightly isolated. And OpenShift um, has mechanisms for restricting that, but they weren't, they weren't as easy to use and as developer friendly as they should be. So there's been a lot that's changed in the ecosystem since OpenShift 1 and OpenShift 2 were launched. As we've gone forward as, um, you know, obviously to anybody who's been paying attention to the platform as a service space or the infrastructure space, the rise of containerization and leveraging the abilities that the Linux kernel now um, has in a fairly stable form to allow individual processes on, an in, on a Linux host to pretend like they're these little independent uh, machines to be able to um, break some of these assumptions that before, if you were running lots of different services on the same machine, each of those services had to be pretty careful not to stomp on the other. And that's really changed uh, with the introduction of containerization. So containerization is essentially taking the lessons of virtualization at the hardware and software level, and taking those a step further, we have the same tools that the virtualization space has in a lot of cases. And for us, it was really clear that it's a bad idea to try to pretend like everything that's being built in the containerization space is new, or to not look at those spaces for examples, but instead to focus on this really from the perspective of what we want to offer um, people are very simple components of an application, but all of the patterns and abstractions that make running individual VMs and running individual machines in a network and the way that those machines connect to each other, we want to apply that and make that, um, make that pattern apply to containers as well. And if you know, people who are deploying at scale today already, in a large case they're, they're running some form of software-defined networking. Um, that software-defined networking might be the controller plane where switches and um, big enterprise um, networking gear is in place. Those might be things like Open vSwitch and um, the work in OpenStack around Neutron. It might be um, some of the new, startup, um, new startups in this space who are building overlay networks on top of um, existing hardware. And there's trade-offs and advantages to both, but to us it was really important that we acknowledge that we're moving into a space that there are solutions, and OpenShift really wants to leverage those solutions and apply them to containers, apply them to the applications that people build on top of OpenShift, um, provide an abstraction that makes, um, as a developer takes their application and runs it, we want to be as flexible as possible to let the software pretend like it's running on a, a regular machine, um, but impose uh, administrative and operational controls on how those components talk to each other that benefits, um, that benefits the, the operators of this large pool of applications. So uh, coming out of our, our goals is really having, if there is an SDN solution already in place in a network, uh, we as OpenShift want to be able to take advantage of it. So instead of 
virtualizing container or virtualizing VMs. We might be virtualizing containers, but the network infrastructure that exists to support that is a very real solution that we don't want to ignore. On the flip side, for organizations who either are scaling up small deployments and need something small and self-contained, um, they don't necessarily have the programmability that uh, a containerized system might need. Or if you're doing a proof of concept or in a very small test environment, we also don't want to have an overly um, complex uh, setup so that you can start OpenShift up and try it on a few machines and grow it. So taking those lessons learned uh, from OpenShift to there were really three fundamental principles. Uh, first, that every component of an application should have its own IP. And when we say component of an application, usually in the OpenShift sense, we're talking about a network service. And so a network service having its own IP starts to play into other higher level concepts that already exist that have been you know, baked into software for 30 or 40 years now, things like DNS and load balancing, things like L3 routing, um, the ability to isolate and define components, not just by a port, but actually by an IP to segregate networks. And segregation is also really important. So observationally, in many cases, developers aren't the ones who are setting network policies today. And developers, that's not really the thing that matters to them. Uh, the use cases that we've tried to target are an administer, um, administrator, whether that's the cluster administrator or an administrator who's responsible for a subset of the applications on a cluster, can fairly easily define the segregation so that within this small cluster, they have the, they can easily tie together a set of applications so that they have visibility and keep the rest of the world at bay. And there's more advanced scenarios here too. Uh, obviously in the future, we want to enable a greater programmability of this, um, but with OpenShift 3, we're kind of starting at that simple subdivision, whether you have one subdivision or lots of subdivisions, it needs to be something an administrator can go make happen, uh, especially in production environments. And then finally, there's a pretty significant difference between development and production. Um, there's a lot of use cases for OpenShift where you're building lots of development applications and each of those applications is a throwaway thing. It gets used for a few days and maybe it sits around or gets deleted after a while when people haven't used it enough. But that, that lifespan for a development application is usually about just trying to keep it isolated from everything else in the cluster. When you start moving into production, many of those applications start to have more significant requirements. So things like uh, DMZs, demilitarized zones, uh, controlling the flow of network traffic into a cluster uh, and fitting into the existing um, requirements and organizational structures um, that exist. So if you are building a new production application from scratch in on top of OpenShift, uh, it's likely that you're still trying to fit into the organizational and uh, security requirements of your existing infrastructure. And our goal with OpenShift would be to allow those, those sorts of decisions to be made um, by administrators for those applications. And Ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, our goal with OpenShift 3 is to stop pretending like um, these individual components aren't just talking onto a network. Uh, an application is composed of multiple pieces. The best way that we have today for multiple pieces to talk to each other is to give them an IP address. So OpenShift 3 is based on top of Docker and Kubernetes. If, if we haven't hit you over the head enough with that by now, um, we can certainly come and hit you over the head a lot more with it. But there's really two implications here. Uh, in OpenShift 3 being based on these lower level concepts, so Docker as a container, um, a container engine, and Kubernetes as a cluster uh, runtime environment for containers, there's two pieces that need to work well. Docker today assigns an IP to a container when it gets started. So those application components are getting an IP assigned by the container. The default setup for that today is typically not very uh, friendly to cross-host communication. There's been a lot of discussion and uh, generous back and forth on the, in the Docker community about what the right way is to implement and integrate networking. And we want to remain flexible to that and where the Docker ecosystem goes in the future. Uh, but I think that when you step up above the Docker level, there's a really important piece of building these components of an application that it's worth talking about what the implications are. So 
if I have one container, if I have MySQL. Um, sometimes I need to do something that's more complex than just talking to it over the network. Um, I might need to share things on the file system and coordinate. I might want to do an IPC call from uh, my one service to my other service, and those processes need to be co-located on the same machine. And in some cases, I might want to set up one container that is a, a public web server like Nginx or Apache and talk over localhost to another web service like um, a Python web framework or a Ruby web framework like Unicorn or um, some of the existing technologies in the space. And that localhost communication isn't really well defined if we're just talking about these separate individual containers. So kind of the key concept in OpenShift 3 um, being built on top of Kubernetes is the idea of a pod. The pod is an application component. It's like an OpenShift 2 gear. It can be just a single container, but another one of those takeaways from OpenShift 2 was that there's a lot of very important use cases for making, uh, making things work together well that don't necessarily need to talk across the network, but need to talk across a file system or IPC or over disk or over localhost, that there's still value in having a concept above the container level. So in Kubernetes, that's called a pod. And in OpenShift 3, that'll really be our fundamental unit of scaling up. So a pod, in a sense, is like a little VM. It's a set of containers that are running together. So down in the lower right here on this slide, you can see that the, I might be running MySQL and PHP my admin. Both of those are individual containers. MySQL is listening on port 3306, but perhaps I don't want to make PHP my admin visible to the network. So PHP my admin might be listening on localhost port 8080, and MySQL might be listening on 3306, but accessible to other components. That pod is what gets an IP address. And that's a really important distinction just in that um, some of the sophistication of the use cases built around this depend on being able to tell Docker what the IP address is that we want the container to have. So um, in order to do this, um, what happens is OpenShift is going to spin up these pods on each machine by uh, working with Kubernetes. Each of these pods, when they start up, is a container that has the network namespace. That's going to get an IP address. And then the rest of the containers, for instance, MySQL or PHP MyAdmin, will start up and they'll be part of that network namespace, which means they all have the same IP address and they're re related to each other. Um, the assignment of that IP address is really where we come into the next phase of um, what we'll be talking about and showing today uh, in a few minutes, is how do we assign the IP address? So that pod is like a little VM. It needs to be assigned an address by the cluster, and that could be uh, depending on what sort of environment you have today, um, you're running on a host. Um, you're running as a subcomponent of a host, so you're not really using the host's address, although there are some scenarios where you may want to do that. It really falls into three categories, um, broken down by how much work someone else has done for you already. So in cases where you're running on top of uh, infrastructure as a service, um, the majority of the solutions out there, of the infrastructure as a service solutions out there today have some concept of machines getting multiple IP addresses. So Google, who um, originally started the Kubernetes project that we've been involved in um, quite a bit since it started, um, took advantage of a lot of the things that Google Compute Engine adds, such as the ability for each host to get its own subnet that has 256 IPs. So on GCE, um, if you're using, if you're running Kubernetes on GCE or you're running OpenShift on top of Kubernetes on top of GCE, the networking story is pretty well baked in. The story gets more complex for everybody else. So AWS, for example, gives you, um, depending on the size of the instance, you can allocate and use multiple IPs per host. And in many existing infrastructure, or any, many existing enterprise network solutions, this capability is certainly possible, but it does require some level of coordination to allocate those IPs out and give them. Um, what started to happen with Docker, especially is, you know, lots of uh, people realize how important it is to be able to allocate containers IP addresses. And so you've seen a number of solutions um, coming from various startups, CoreOS with Flannel and Weave um, with their overlay network have 
um, created little daemons that run on each process that are able to talk to each other and form um, a virtual network. And this is a, a pretty old concept, but again, as with, um, with containers, there's more room for these sorts of things to be set up and spun down on the fly. Now, overlay networks do come with some performance uh, disadvantages. And so we, when we talk about setting up networks in a dynamic fashion, kind of the, the big boy in this space, um, at least as, as we see it, is open vSwitch. So most people doing some level of SDN are either dealing with open vSwitch or have integrated into vSwitch, open vSwitch. Um, OpenStack um, in many configurations is running an open vSwitch type of setup where uh, the sort of abstraction between the control plane and the runtime plane is either handled in software talking to hardware or software talking to software. So with OpenShift 3, we knew that there were going to be existing solutions that we needed to integrate into, um, but we also knew that we would need some level of a solution that worked with um, open vSwitch to do just enough to let someone work at small scales, but to have the flexibility to replace, to change out, or to supplement those capabilities with their own. So th these choices aren't binary, it's not one or the other, and there are many other ways of configuring these networks. So our goal with OpenShift has always been to work with the upstream communities, Docker and Kubernetes, to make these flexible, and then out of the box have something that's just simple enough that we can get over that hump. Um, and if you're an OpenShift administrator and you want to spin up and start building applications right away, to give something that works at a reasonable enough performance level that we can leverage the existing investment that many, many companies and organizations have already put into their SDN solutions. And Open vSwitch was a natural target for that. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Bridget and uh, Mernal to do a demo of what um, exists uh, in the current, in a very development form in OpenShift uh, to work with uh, Kubernetes containers and Open vSwitch. All right. There was one question that popped up um, before they get going, and um, Judd Maitland um, had asked, how much of this is dependent on C group V2? Uh, very little of this should be dependent on that, although I'll let Rajat answer that. So, uh, are you talking about C groups in general or the networking aspects? Uh, to answer that from his car. He may be on mute. Can I use voice? I can yes, use voice, can. no? Go for it, yes. Great. Um, uh, for the containerization, containerization in general um, was implemented uh, in the Linux kernel over the past several years as C sure. groups. Um, just went to a, um, a Linux users group meeting where I got um, the guys who are, are re -re rewriting C groups uh, for V2, um, and uh, it looks like we're going to get a lot more protection, a lot more flexibility, uh, and predictability in uh, in C groups from what's coming in V2. But they don't have a timeline. They're hoping so, in the next six months. So. so uh, uh, I at the low, lowest levels, lib container uses C groups today, and as uh, the V2 comes out, those features will be integrated and available in Docker. Yeah, so nothing we show today will be dependent or require yeah. V2. Um, they'll just get better as those things um, make their way into the upstream communities. Okay, so you're 100% relying on lib container. Yes, so Docker uses lib container today, and uh, LXC is the other backend. And so both of them use C groups under the hood for controlling memory, CPU, and all the options uh, that C groups provides. Yeah, OpenShift is, um, Mernal is a contributor to libcontainer, or one of the maintainers for libcontainer. And so our goal usually is going to be um, to work in that community as you know features like that come up, we'll work to get that in libcontainer and then into Docker and then serviced up uh, through the various mechanisms in the system. Okay. More questions later. All right, let's go on with the demo. Is Munral? Is that yeah. you talking right now? No, this is this is Rajat, and I'm going to show the demo of uh, OpenShift SDN, uh, which is the simple form of networking. What Clayton has been describing. Uh, this has uh, I can describe what the architecture looks like. What it tries to achieve, though, is any container that comes up 
or any pod in OpenShift terms that comes up uh, gets a, a unique IP address and uh, anyone else on the cluster, be it a pod or the host itself, or an external plugin component should be able to reach uh, the new pod with the network assigned by this SDN controller. So um, uh, I, what I got is this um, three node, uh, rather two node cluster controlled by a master. Uh, uh, just if you can see my screen, I think, yes. Uh, so I got two minions here, which means two nodes and uh, pods can land up on any of the minions. Uh, containers can be born any of, of these places. If they're entirely controlled by OpenShift, then only pods will be created. But if, if it's being shared by someone else, then just random containers can show up as well. What this uh, controller does uh, here is there's a master setup running. Uh, is a demon which runs, uh, and this guy is supposed to say, okay, I've, I've got some minions here, minion number one, minion number two, and as they will come in the future or go away, um, I'm gonna start assigning subnets to the entire minion, and the subnet would be default 256 IP addresses, which means 256 IP addresses would be available to that minion. And I got minion one here on my left, minion two on my right, and if we go there, uh, say, hey, how is Docker doing? I'm going to reassign uh, Docker saying, hey, don't use your original bridge. Start using this new bridge that I've created. And if I say IPA there, I got to see this Linux bridge there. And it's got a subnet already, which was assigned by the master. On the other node, I got similar stuff, but of course a different subnet. What I see from here, say okay let me create some pods i will actually just do a creation of pod there I say get some pods there and, and say okay there's something is already running there where it's running on open minion one and it's got an ip address here and this ip address should be reachable from from of course the host there we can say docker ps or well, this is running here and i can say bing and I should be able to ping it from the host itself. I should be able to ping it from the other host. I'll just copy paste that. Yeah, I should be able to curl it. Because it happens to be serving something there. Yes, it does work. Uh, what's going on here is that Docker was given a subnet and Docker says, okay, I'll spin out new containers using that subnet. But who is going to transmit those packets from when it is going across the host? Well, that's where Open vSwitch comes in. And um, Open vSwitch says, uh, I'm going to grab all packets which are meant locally uh, for the host itself and not bother about them. And what I'm going to do is the ones which are meant for across the host, I'm going to identify by the destination address. And I'm going to put some flows there. Uh, open. I can show the flows there. Open flow 30 dump flows. This is open flow. This is implementation of open vSwitch. OVS VSCTL show. And I got a VXLAN kind of a dangling tunnel there which says uh, the remote IP is programmable, which means when the packet needs to go out of this machine, which means the pod was not living inside this host itself. When I did a ping there, there was no Docker container here. So when I did a ping here, it says, okay, 10102, I gotta figure out where I need to go. It says, okay, if you're coming from the Docker, which is local, and you're supposed to be in this 10102 subnet, 10100 subnet, go out to output 10. Output 10 is a VXLAN port, and I'm telling you where it is. It's living on minion one. And that's where it gets there. And the same thing happens here and Open vSwitch is able to say, okay, I'm gonna transmit packet. It's controlled by Open Flow. Any new node that gets added in the cluster, we add uh, new rules here saying, oh, well, there's a new guy, pods might just land up there. We need to direct traffic, accept traffic from there. What this thing does is connectivity between containers 
what this thing does not do is isolation. I don't know if Clayton has a few words on isolation, but I have a different demo where we can so show how isolation can happen. I mean, by isolation, I don't know, Clayton, if you have more slides there. Sure. Uh, I, I do. But, uh, um, we can. Yeah. We can show some of the slides afterwards. Um, uh, why don't we Why don't we go ahead and talk about, you know, um, actually, uh, well, why don't you just continue with the demo? Isolation in general, what we're talking about is, I mentioned before, administrators want to be able to segment. So what we would like to do kind of out of the box by default is every group of people, every project, um, which in OpenShift 2 we call the domain, and in OpenShift 3 it's called a project to more closely align it with things like OpenStack. Each project would probably get its own, um, we would want to have a mode where each project gets its own segregated network, and you can see the IPs of other things, but you wouldn't be able to reach them from inside that network. And as soon as we have that, obviously there's some solutions, there's some uh, problems people would hit, obviously, if you need those two projects to talk. Um, so there's, some ad there's an additional set of features up above where we'd want to have some simple programmability and then let administrators go build um, and integrate more custom solutions that work with their existing, um, if they have uh, programmable networks already, um, you know, something that can do network programmability, we'd want to let those integrate and we'd want to feed those with that information. But for most administrators, people who don't have that kind of flexibility, we'd want to give very simple tools to let you um, to manage those networks. So why don't you go ahead, uh, Rajat? Okay, yeah, so just, just the part, this, this is the uh, simple part of the demo. I mean, uh, we have a flat network. Every minion gets a subnet. Every Docker container gets uh, a portion of that subnet. And across the uh, network, uh, every container should be able to talk to another container. Well, I showed how we can talk from a host to another container where I'm just spinning up is a new container here. I just did, and uh, it, it says, okay, well, you got this IP address. On the other minion, I'm going to say, and get inside a, in, inside the container there. Uh, so, I'm going to get inside this container and say, if oh, IPA. Now, this guy has got this this container and I should be able to reach from container to container. Yeah, that well, works. And the other guy also should be presumably working. Yeah, that works. So that's the end of this kind of demo, uh, which is simple, uh, flat network. Uh, I'm gonna switch uh, to the other demo, uh, which if you're ready for, I will be able to show uh, an isolation piece, what Clayton was talking about. Uh, now, the isolation bits are uh, kind of uh, subject to how the OpenShift administrator chooses uh, they want to do the isolation. Uh, wait a second. You stop sharing your presentation. Yeah, I know. I actually have a different computer for oh. my isolation demo. I didn't want to squeeze all of these virtual boxes into my puny box there. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I think I have the other one running now. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And in this one, I got um, one master uh, and three minions. And the isolation that we have chosen, I as an administrator of this cluster has chosen, is that I'm going to isolate per namespace. Now, Kubernetes has the concept of namespace as in, uh, you could say that, you know, uh, in an enterprise, this is user one or user two or department one or department two. We can also say that, hey, uh, I, I don't want to isolate by projects, but I want to also isolate by uh, placement of the machines, which means uh, data center one has X machines and data center two has Y machines. Uh, I, I just don't want uh, any of the projects there to cross over uh, to the other data center or something. Or you could have an environment saying, I have test environment or prod environment. I, I don't want the traffic to go across each other you know, have uh, the network should be isolated. What I've done here is though, uh, it'll be isolated by projects as in uh, namespaces. Now this is Kubernetes. This, this is kind of a little bit rung lower than the OpenShift thing, but, but the concept should remain the same. So I just did this, um, get pods. I've got two pods here. Uh, one is called hi, the other is called hello. Uh, one of them is on uh, minion one, 
and one of them is on minion two, I think, let's say, no, three and four. So it's on minion two and minion three. I got minion two here, or minion three here. I also got another namespace. And whenever, whenever Rajat says namespace, namespace and project in OpenShift and Kubernetes are very similar concepts. Project is the the higher level access control quota authorization um, grouping concept um, that makes Kubernetes use namespaces useful to people who have multiple tenants or want to subdivide. Um, so just as the distinction there. Yes, thank you, Clayton. Yeah, in my mind, I just changed them interchangeably. Yeah. Okay, so namespace or project. So this is this is another project or a namespace which was called ABC. The other one was the default one. So in the first one, I got two uh, containers, hi and hello. In 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 the second one, I got hola and namaste. Now uh, I clearly have uh, defined as an admin that anyone who goes into a separate namespace, they shouldn't be able to talk to each other, no matter where they're living. They're living across minions or on the same host or whatever it is, they shouldn't be able to see each other. While they should be able to get unique uh, network parameters, they should be able to have uh, talk, be able to talk between each other. So I should be able to talk to hello, hola should be talk, able to talk to namaste, but not across each other. So uh, I got this. On minion two, there is high living. On minion three, there is hello living. On minion one, there is namaste living. On minion two, there is hola living on minion two. So I got hola and hi. So I'm going to go to minion two and say, what what have we got here? Docker PS, but we got four containers, uh, basically two pods, one being the network container, the other being the actual container. So two pods there and Docker PS grab. Just to make it highlightable. I got one pod here, which is the high one. I'm going to go inside. Uh, Docker PS, no, oh, Docker Inspect, sorry. And I see here, and I got an IP address here. I'm going to go on minion three and also do the same thing. Uh, I see what, what is running here is the hello guy uh, so let's get inside this fellow <laughs> and I got 24613 now this was hello guy this is the hi guy right so they should be able to talk to each other ping uh, ping the other guy who is 10.46.15 and um, it does work beautifully there. I can curl it. 145.80.80 and it serves it. Now my uh, this guy's IP address was 246.13 so the similar thing should work from that side. I should be able to curl this fellow and say well nice. Now I'm going to go into the other guy which was the Hola fellow on the same um, minion two. And now this guy should not be able to talk to the guy on the minion three. So docker inspect. Uh, nice. This guy's got its own IP address, which is unique. The other fellow had 104615. This got 16. This guy's got 13. But I shouldn't be able to talk to 13 or 15. Uh, 13 was it? Yep. 13. And I press enter and says, oh, uh, nah. Won't work because it's denied. Uh, and if this guy wants to talk to, it's uh, this is the Hola guy, and it wants to talk to the Namaste guy, uh, I happen to know the IP address, so I can just say, yes, it works. On, on the same machine, the uh, other fellow lives, which is high, on the same machine, 
and this container cannot talk to the container on the same machine or pod. Uh, that's the end of the demo. Uh, what's going on beneath is the same OVS stuff, um, but it's much more complicated because it, it, it's just not as a subnet now. What happens is uh, every pod gets connected to an open vSwitch bridge and we got rules pre-programmed. And this guy says, hi says, I want to talk to hello. And it says, okay, before talking, are you going to send an R packet? Yes, of course, there's be an R packet first. And we've got a pre-programmed R responder in open vSwitch using the open flow. He said, I already know what the MAC address of that guy is going to be. Here it is, here's the R response. It says, okay, fine, I figured what the R, uh, MAC address is. And then it says, can you send this packet to that MAC address? And uh, open flow rules are saying, are you a genuine guy? Are, am I, I am going to test uh, that if you are uh, indeed a, 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 pack, a, a container which is meant to talk to that other destination, which means I'm going to check your tunnel ID, then check that if the destination is this guy, then I'm going to send you to another port where I will tell you how to reach that guy. And when it reaches there, then uh, it kind of comes back and says, okay, well, you guys are genuinely okay. If a spurious container was supposed to talk to, were, were happened to talk to a guy who he was not supposed to talk to, then open flow uh, rules would not match and say, hey, I don't see your tunnel ID uh, matching anywhere, uh, which means you're not supposed to talk. And uh, that's how it is. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, this was a detailed demo. Uh, we can go over the architecture in detail, uh, but the summary being we're just using open vSwitch and open flow <laughs> using isolation. The other demo was a flat network where we just kind of just assign subnets where there's no isolation, but uh, reachability across pods. Any questions? So there were a couple of questions while you were talking, uh, which I think I wanted to address. So um, one of the, the first question was, this does seem like there's a lot of complexity. And I think our goal with OpenShift 3 is that there is a lot of complexity out there Lots of people have different solutions. Um, we really have two goals, support customers who have existing solutions, who have investments in existing network infrastructure to help them plug their networks into OpenShift um, so that they can you know, run those things the way that they would expect to. The other side is we still want to have an easy out of the box experience. And what Rajat was showing was trying to use the same technologies that we expect many people in the, in the industry to work with so that when we build this example, we're actually trying to build it using the same hook points that all our customers and everyone who's using OpenShift who's setting things up uh, would need in order to go do this for their own stuff. So it's, it, you know, there's a lot of complexity here and this is, um, this is a really new area for a lot of people who might be coming from OpenShift too, but we, we're really trying to bridge the gap for the future. So we want to have something that's simple enough that you can configure this in a, in an out of the box way um, and try to, you know, you may not get all of the power or flexibility that you want, but you have a, a solution that will scale and, and fit a reasonable amount of use cases. Uh, and then just keep focusing on helping people go from maybe a world where they're just using flat machines to a world where there's a little bit more sophistication involved in the network stack. And we expect to, you know, we really want to take feedback from people in the community as we go forward on this about the complexity of various bits and what, how we can work with um, Kubernetes to make this easier. So um, uh, Rajat and Mernal have been working with, um, in, the, in Kubernetes with um, people from a number of different networking solutions. There's, a, there's actually a meeting scheduled this Friday to discuss some of the ways that we want to integrate this into Kubernetes. And we've also been working um, at the Docker layer to try and make sure that there's a lot of networking solutions that people can take advantage of that we can just consume as well. So totally understand there's complexity and if, if people have concerns about that, those are the things that we want to know so that we can help find that path. Sandeep, if you want to go ahead. So, so <clears throat> Yeah, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. Thank you. Hey, uh, Clayton, this is Sandeep from Cisco. Um, a quick question around um, the pluggability um, <clears throat> around the networking pieces uh, in OpenShift and specifically uh, in Kubernetes. I know we've had discussions with Murnal and Rajat around this. 
where um, if, if an enterprise or a service provider already has, as you mentioned, um, a, a overlay network or whatever kind of network, and they have policies around um, IP address um, management and so on, that's where you want to go. How far are you along um, in terms of getting you know, feedback from the community around what that might look like? So um, I'll let Murnal and um, Rajat jump on and add anything they want to say. Uh, we, we have agreement, really, that we want to the, the point at which time the network gets set up. So, you know, OpenShift is going to talk to Kubernetes and Kubernetes, the bits of Kubernetes that carry that information to the point where we go to start the container. We mm -hmm. want to make sure that all of the, the metadata that's necessary to make a decision gets passed down so that there's some hook point down at a very low level that says, I want to go start this container that is part of this network and also have the ability to add flexible metadata that comes from, you know, administrators might set an open shift all the way down and at that point hand it off to a plug point, um, which might be a local script, it might be, you know, some sort of, um, you know, compiled module or something, but to hand that information off and then to say, this is where you have all the information either connect to something that's already pre-configured, in which case you don't have to make those decisions, or be able to run something that watches OpenShift and Kubernetes to set up things ahead of time. So for instance, a new pod is going to go get created. Um, somebody can use the APIs that we've put together in OpenShift and Kubernetes to see that that's going to happen, to make the reaction on the other side that says, oh, I've got a new pod coming in from this particular project. I'm going to go ask, you know, do a more complex decision-making process and decide what network it goes to. Those, I think the more complex things are probably going to, there's going to be a series of steps here where we try to get the simple integration and then gradually increase it. Um, but those are goals for us for OpenShift 3.0. Okay. Yeah, because, okay. go ahead, Reza. Sorry. Yeah, I, yeah, I was just trying to uh, say what Clayton said uh, with the fact, you know, like this demo is an example of how an integration might work out with another provider. Now, open vSwitch and whatever these flows that I showed, of course, are uh, throwable if there is another network provider which is capable of providing us uh, a network with parameters, with QoS and isolation. And, and we can just say, instead of calling open vSwitch, let's call that network. Uh, provider's interface. Uh, right. I know we've been talking separately. Uh, this is a work in progress, I guess. I, and as many uh, plugins we can have, I, I think so, that'll be better. So, so Sandeep, I, I think uh, to answer your question about uh, how progress, so the idea is that there's going to be a community hangout tomorrow, and uh, we're thinking that we'll propose some solid POCs to demonstrate each of the hook points to take this forward. And I mean, we okay, so can participate as well. Yeah, that makes sense because um, as as we were talking about, I guess it's how you hand off that information. Um, so whatever you have in op Open vSwitch, um, if, if it comes with Open uh, OpenShift, then it's going to be you know already the the hooks are already going to be there. But if we need to add other types of networking, how do you actually call that networking piece? Is what needs to be figured out, right? Right, and and yeah. that 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 would be the whole discussion around how networks would be pluggable into Kubernetes. Yeah, and... yeah, 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 yeah. I have another question, but this is not related to networking. So maybe I'll hold off. I'll do it. Uh, it's it's around the pluggability. Um, uh, your your opinions on how pluggable you want to make OpenShift in general, and networking just being just a flavor of it. So the answer there is infinitely. Um, the practical answer is probably slightly less than infinitely. Uh, a, a key, just um, just as a quick answer to that, purely architecturally, we have tried to make it so that every major piece of function in OpenShift 3 is a composition type setup so that we have like a, the simple core and then things build around it, which means, you know, obviously this is always always going to come into support and complexity, but we would like to be able to let administrators rip out whole chunks and chunks of the decisions we make and replace them with their own decisions, as well as having all of the APIs they need to react to things that are happening in the cluster. And 
you know, we, we probably need to have a better document uh, drawn up on how we want to um, make this pluggability possible. It's, a lot of it is embedded in the designs, but it's not necessarily called out in one place. Sounds fair. And I'll, instead of, you know, uh, talking about it here, I'll probably just open up an issue to, to, uh, to uh, show where, where we're going around use cases for pluggability. So. Thanks. Gotcha. Right. Does, it, does anyone else have any other questions? You want to add any closing thoughts, Clayton? Uh, sure. So the um, the deck that I showed, um, we'll send that around. At the end of it, there's a lot of different examples of the use cases that we think are application specific. Um, you know, the, if you think about OpenShift, it's our job, our goal really is to make it easy to run applications. And so we've tried to kind of bake those down into a couple of different important use cases around the network for applications. Obviously, this is going to continue to evolve um, throughout the, the OpenShift 3 timeline. So uh, feedback on are there use cases that we've missed? Are there things that are important to people who are building applications today, either on top of OpenShift or not, that um, they're concerned about how those might be possible? Because our goal has always been to be able to bring the bulk of the world's applications onto the paths so that administrators can broaden that, you know, the operational efficiency. So with networking, um, trying to make a lot of the networking automatic and have specialized solutions where possible so that that's one less thing administrators have to deal with. Um, you know, working with uh, this sort of automation of applications at scale, if you can define some simple rules that say all of these applications are isolated and all these applications should be linked together, that takes one more burden off the administrator's shoulders. All right, then. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming, and Clayton and Munral and Rajat for, for taking the time today. Um, we'll have another session next week on storage, and I'll send out the notes to the OpenShift Commons mailing list, and you're all invited to join us for that. This recording will be up um, in a couple of hours, probably after we're done processing it, um, and available on the Origin OpenShift site, and I'll post that link to the mailing list as well. So thanks again, everybody, for coming and um, participating in the OpenShift Commons.